on next year. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Doug Dodd. I'm chairman of the school board, and I'm going to call a special meeting to order. Uh, today is Tuesday, June the 19th. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, June 26th. Mm -hmm. uh, Tuesday, June 26th. And the time is 9.02. So we'll call the special meeting to order, and uh, we have our opening exercises by Sandy Kemps. Okay. And I've got the morning prayer. Uh, good morning, God. We're ushering in another day and touched and freshly new. So here we come to ask you, God, if you will renew us too. Forgive the many errors that we might have made yesterday, and let us try again, dear God, to walk closer in that way. But Father, we are well aware that we cannot make it on our own. So take our hands and hold them tight, for we cannot walk alone. Stand for the pledge. <laughs> some things to add to the agenda so um, let me add on section four uh, school support services we want to add a number six seven and eight uh, that is for uh, the approval of Molly Chandler as assistant principal for Old City Elementary School effective July 1 2018 And then we're going to add number seven, which is to approve Amanda Haynes as assistant principal at Hernando Elementary School, effective July 1, 2018. And then item number eight would be to approve Jamie Bays as assistant principal at Lakanto Primary School. And there's not an effective date on that, is that July? July 1. Okay, July 1, um, as of July 1, effective July 1, 2018. Also, under number five, attorney legal matters, um, the Alice Service Agreement will be added. Alice Service Agreement, Mr. Bradshaw. So, is there any questions about those additions uh, to the agenda? I move mean, to adopt and come with the additions today. Second. All right. Motion by Ms. Power, second by Mr. Kenny to adopt the agenda with the changes just mentioned. Is there any questions or? Comments. Okay, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion passes 5 0. <clears throat> Very good. Uh, we will have a time now for citizen comments. Do we have any cards? No. Anyone like to address the board? Any citizen comments? All right, very good. Okay, we'll move on to item number three educational services. Mr. Hebert, Dr. Hebert, and to approve the mental health assistant allocation plan. Yes, I'm asking for approval of the Mental Health Assistance Allocation Plan, and Kit Humbaugh, the Director of Student Services, is here. If you um, want to review or, or share any, um, information with you on that plan. Okay, Ms. Humbaugh. I'm not sure what you are um, going to ask this powers. I do have a <coughs> PowerPoint, just a general overview, if that would be maybe helpful. Am 
I going to be okay pulling out the USB? Is this someone else's that's in here? Yes. is good enough, if, if I may, I would like to introduce Gina Dickey. She's the new coordinator of student services. Gina, this is our school board. <laughs> and I believe you've met Mr. Radshaw and Ms. Himmel, and Mr. Dodd is our chairman. And you met Mr. Kennedy, Sandy Counts, Ms. Counts, Ms. Powers, and Ms. Bryant. You've met Mr. Mullen. Okay. Gina is the coordinator. She's me. <laughs> the new kid. Yes. So this is just basically what this is, is an outline of everything that is in the plan that you all received last week. <clears throat> the first part of it is the funding, which what the plan is calling for is, with the money, is the hiring of two additional school psychologists, four social workers, a student services specialist, and then other funding would be for professional development and the implementation of the mental health plan. So with the money that is allocated to us, 90% of it has to be spent on mental health services and then 10% of the plan is on the implementation. The services that we have outlined that are in the plan are a universal screener for all students, a broad problem solving team at each school, additional assessments when that is um, determined through a screener that additional assessments are needed on students, interventions and progress monitoring, interventions, things that we have to put in place when um, services and needs are identified and we are required, which we would do anyway, to progress monitor the success of the students and the assistance that they're getting then referrals for services, internal and external. Internal would be our school-based. For example, if a teacher thought that a child was, you know, displaying some some behavior that maybe needed additional um, interventions, an internal would be what we have school-based. That's our school psychologists, our social workers, our school counselors, and then external would be those services when students are identified who need therapeutic needs, when they actually have like a diagnosis, such as bipolar or um, post-traumatic syndrome, those types of things. Those would be external with outside mental health services uh, providers. And then we plan on revising our Baker Act follow-up procedure. Currently, we follow up on every Baker Act, whether it's in um, done in the school, on school campus, or off campus, and the whole team felt a need that there's more to this instead of just one follow-up, that there's multiple follow-ups with these students. Threat assessment, we've had a threat assessment since 2005, a manual that the team 
believes should be updated, and then the uh, crisis manual. <coughs> Threat assessment, crisis manual, those are things that are shared with the administrative teams every year at the beginning of the year. And um, the social workers, school counselors, nurses, those types of people are all part of those reviews. Ms. Humble? Yes. I'm revising the uh, Baker Act follow-up procedure, and you said that we'd follow up on, on either. It, it was my understanding, though, that if they don't get Baker, if they get Baker acted off campus, we don't, the state or no LED provides us with any information regarding a student that's Baker acted off campus unless the family lets us that's be correct. aware of that. That's correct. If, in, and I would say this also uh, to Chairman Dodd with uh, your committee with Parkman. That's a problem <laughs> because we, we are only now having as much information as we are voluntarily provided. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, but yet what we know is the, the burden is put on the school districts. So right. I hope that changes. I mean, to me, there should be a, a way to have a secure database where that information is provided to you. I, I do too. And, and I can't even speculate <clears throat> how many there are off campus that we don't ever know about. We find out the ones off campus by either a student coming in and disclosing that information or a parent calls or I don't know if it's the right process, but sometimes some of the school the SROs will share that with their, uh, with their school. Some SROs will not share that with their schools. When I came on board five years ago, every Baker Act that was done off campus was sent to student services so we knew every single one and then actually I hadn't been there but a couple of months and that that sharing of information stopped so you know I, I really I, I don't know how many there would be total because we just don't get that information when it's done off campus and and that's something I think maybe as a board as we start developing things for our legislative agenda that we talk with our legislative group we need to <coughs> to ask mm -hmm. that that's something we need, need. And, and I know we're not going to be alone in that. And I will add, when we, we treat the ones off campus, when we receive that information, just like ones that would have happened on campus. We do the same process, you know, the follow-up, monitoring, all of that. It's just that the follow-up procedure that there, it needs to be a little more um, on a continuum, that we don't just meet one time, that that student is still Right. You know. Let me just interrupt here, and I know Mr. Bradshaw might have something to add to on the threat assessment team requirement, though, that's in Senate Bill uh, 726. Now, that's going to require the sharing of information between agencies. So my question, I guess, is how are you going to ensure that we're getting that information? Because it is going to be available. It is going to be available to be shared with the school district through the threat assessment team. Mm -hmm. So. You know, that's something that we need to make sure that we're following up on now. Um, Mr. Bradshaw, would, do you have any ideas or thoughts on that as far as how you read that to Bill? Mm -hmm. I mean, look, I haven't really had that. Yeah. At the very least, though, locally, I wonder if that could be put into the contract, that that's shared information. I would, uh, that's true. Because, I mean, I mean, of information that they have, and... I'll read the thread assessment part of it. Okay. If, if it can be part of the contract. Because the other thing too is if a student is transferred from Marion County, even, um, from what Mr. Dodd said, <coughs> we should then be oh, yeah. having that information. Right. But if we don't know they've been Baker Acted, you know, two years earlier, and we need to be monitoring that or providing services mm -hmm. or follow up, we, you know, we're not going to have that information. And and sometimes <coughs> I, I think it's going to be that those agencies that we are the really the only ones that we can depend on c to get that information. We did add it to the behavior screening, which is a form that is completed when students first enter our school system, but it's a parent that fills out that. We have added what was required for, has your child ever been Baker acted, you know, mental health issues, et cetera. But if they choose to not give that information accurately, they just, you know, say no, 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 um, then we don't, we don't know about it. Some parents will disclose that, many of them don't. 
um, that if we had that from like law enforcement or you know mental health agencies that you know from other places it would be so so very helpful what's coming down now to have that information and to act on that information and to follow up right. on that information. So that's a requirement on us. Mm -hmm. We have to have that information from somebody else. And that's our problem. So we do need to have written into some sort of contract that this information needs to be provided for us to do the job that we're told we had to have to do for the state of Florida. I'm looking at the current system part of the mid-list multiple agencies versus shares. But this is this is though where we want to talk also to legislators to say that we can't be just dependent on having that information shared. There needs to be some centralization of the, of a database or something. I agree. Because mm -hmm. you know, um, with all the best intentions, mm -hmm. if that information isn't something that can be popped up, I mean, we would not expect law enforcement to be dependent on having their own database from Citrus County separate from Marion County. We can't do that if we're going to be, you know, doing what we're we're tasked to do. Right. Well, and you have to realize that you know the Baker Act is a temporary intervention. It's not meant to be a long-term solution for mental health issues, and that adds another component to this because if a child was Baker Acted two, three, four years ago, they may not. I mean, very possibly, they could be over the event that took place that caused them to be Baker Acted. And just because a child is Baker Acted, you know, up to 72 hours is what the law allows them to be evaluated for, and most of them aren't even close to that, but, you know, that doesn't mean that two weeks later something else could happen. I mean, you know, it, it really, but what the Baker Act is to address the issue immediate at hand. So I think the challenge for us is going to be how are we following up on the Baker Acts and at what, you know, what point, I mean, how are we keeping track of mental health issues, the mobile reporting app that's going to be required, it's going to be forced down upon counties to react to issues of threats is going to have to be addressed. I know, you know, we've talked a little bit about that. We don't have a clear picture of how that's going to come out yet. But this is important stuff that we have to make sure we're following up on, we're staying on top of. And I agree with Mr. Kennedy, there still has to be some things done legislatively to make sure there is follow-up and there is a, a record and a sharing of that record uh, so that we can you know, do what's right for kids. And if the information's not shared, it's like the buck stops there. The person not sharing is responsible. Right, give it to us for us to be able to act. Mm -hmm. Maybe there should be something, you know, we, we say, well, we don't have any information to report that. I've never, it needs to be <coughs> well defined. It's not defined well. Yeah, and, and I do think it is going to have to be something legislation wise. And I mean, it's not that I don't try to get that information. Um, the DCF is <coughs> almost just does not share information. And I think that's going to change too. And, um, you, know, I think that's going to change. you know, from when there's an intake and things like that, even with Baker Acts, I mean, we don't get follow-ups from the centers or these other air, or these other um, facilities that take, all, you know, take them in, um, which personally, I think that there should be, I think Mr. Dodd said that, like a central location where we need that information. We don't have to give every little detail, but just to know, you know, this is a student that you need to keep your eyes on. Um, so hopefully that will change because it's very much needed. Ms. Powers, do you have any, I had a couple questions, but I, I know you had, had brought up some things at first. Do you have anything else that you want to ask now or? Um, well, I just want to be sure that in some form that information is shared with us and it's, it's written into a, a contract or an agreement or whatever, but it's solid that we should expect information from the agency, from some group that worked with the student. We need the information for us to be able to do our jobs. If uh, a student is Baker Acting for trying to 
uh, hurt himself and that sort of stuff, and he comes to school, which he can, you know, next couple of days. I should know that I should keep my eye on this student right. because he has tried to do Correct. this, but I have no information. That's exactly right. And there has always been talk about the sharing and uh, fizz fin of somebody at a district having access to that. That's the whole network that shows, you know, the things with child abuse and all of that, and it just never seems to, to go through and to get done where they get that access, you know, to just even, you know, one central person in the district can that can be looking at that information. Mm -hmm. I remember reading an article, this from the last time, uh, an article about the attempted suicides in the county of mm -hmm. younger people, mm -hmm. and it had this number on it. And I went to my notes, and I had this number. It was, I, my number was something like 87. The number presented in the paper was like 187. I said, what? You know, mm -hmm. what is this? Culture to where did these numbers come from? But it's because we didn't have That's shared correct. information. We knew nothing about those who were not inside the school system. Right. Who had been baked around <coughs> or attempted suicide mm -hmm. or hurting themselves and stuff. And we keep track of that, you know, on our report, but that's what I mean. That off campus Baker X, that's not exactly accurate because we don't know of all of them. Right. All right, I've got a question in regard to the uh, credential versus license. Now, I know in your plan on page four, you talk about the credential, credential mental health providers employed in the district. Mm -hmm. um, but yet, I found not all of our social workers are credentialed or licensed mental health. They're not, workers. and they, they don't have to be. Right. So, but it said, then the next paragraph says, with the mental health allocated funds, the school district will employ the below credentialed staff to provide mental health services to students. Mm -hmm. So they're not all credentialed though, are they? Well, they're credentialed from the standpoint of what the state would require for you to have a school counselor. Like for a school counselor, they have to have a master's degree. A social worker, they have to have a bachelor's degree. And they are credentialed in terms of providing the services within like a school. Maybe that's not a good word. Um, but those, they're not licensed, are they? That's the difference, no. Licensed would be like a social worker who goes on from a bachelor's degree and gets their master's degree and then takes the state test. They become a licensed clinical social worker. Those people can deal more with what we call therapeutic services. Ms. Powers and I had this conversation. Those are the ones that, like they've had a diagnosis, they're, you're targeting and trying to provide an intervention for a specific um, mental illness, so to speak, that a student has. That is not what the, the school counselors, the social workers are trained to do. They deal with mainly tier, you know, kids in that have some problems, and then tier one, tier two, maybe some tier three, you know, some some mental problems, but not anything that has been like therapeutic diagnosed. Then, when it gets to that point, that's when we need the outside services. Mm -hmm. And the outside services basically are the centers and the children's home society. That's correct. And, and yet we've heard a lot of issues with the centers in our county. Mm -hmm. So what's the, what is that, what is your um, view on the centers and what they offer us? Well, I know that they are restructuring. I met last week with the supervisor of children's services and she has told me that, you know, they're coming up with a different plan. There's a new um, director. He's actually a medical doctor and um, that they have a lot of different plans, so to speak, to put in place. It's just been inconsistent. The, the services that they've provided have been, you know, they've been acceptable. It's just they've had so many changes that when things change, I feel like we're, we're out of pocket for a little bit of time of not getting services that we need from them. Um, we so, Mike, let me just interrupt for one mm -hmm. second. So my question to Ms. Hill is, and 
I know the county is looking at the contract search. And if that changes, that impacts us on this end too. Is that correct? Well, what happens if the county appoints their umbrella company appoints someone else and removes the centers and puts someone else, and that's who we would deal with. So when Ms. Humboldt speaks of that, remember, they're just like everybody else. They've lost millions of dollars in funding, and I think they're trying to do it. I do, and this supervisor, her name is Diane Giammarco, has been by far the most attentive and just really, really trying to get some things together. And when I met with her last week, I said, you know, I need to know that if we have referrals that need to be done outside of the school, that you can provide those services and that you can come to the school to provide those services. And she has assured me that's something that she's going to be working on. We're going to probably in another week to reconvene after she talks with them with the funding. It just seems like they hire a bunch of them, and then something happens with funding, and then they're gone. And now for us to have, like, why can't we have more providers? They just, they have to come to the district and just contract with the district. Or, you know, we have two providers, the Centers and Children's Home Society, but yet there's other providers out there. So my question is, are we really meeting the needs because we're so limited with who can offer services? Well, there are others that I'm working on, like Families First. There's a therapeutic place that's out of Ocala. I think it's the same one that is contracted with CIRMI. But I've always felt like, and I think most agree, that we have to be very careful having contracts or, you know, contracts, MOUs, et cetera, with private agencies. Because I think once you let a private agency in, then they all want to come in. I mean, you can't really discriminate. The agencies that we deal with, like the Centers, Children's Home Society, Families First, there's a couple of other ones that are out there. We don't have a lot of resources in this area, but they're all grant funded. They're therapeutic or mental health services that are not private, so to speak. You know, where they, like some of the private ones, they have, there's like an umbrella, like the person that is maybe the licensed mental health therapist, and that person has these other therapists working under them, like under their, you know, degree. Same like with our school nurses. Like an RN, the LPNs like work under their, you know, their umbrella. And if a student gets referred to, say, the centers or children's homes, who's then, how does that compare, let's say, payment-wise or funding-wise for that student to receive those services than it would some of these other agencies, the private agencies? As far as I know, it's the same. It's billable services. Primarily, I mean, the majority of them are Medicaid. Some of the agencies, like the centers, they bill for private also. Like if somebody had Blue Cross Blue Shield or Children's Home Society is primarily Medicaid. I'm not sure. No, no, that helps. But even a private agency, it's the same. I see what you're saying. I think the difference, though, is here is those providers can come onto our school campus to provide mental health counseling, but other providers cannot. Other private providers. So my question is, might it be better to have it offered to, I mean, in this world we live, to have any licensed provider that wants to provide services and have a contract with us to be able to come on the school campus to give mental health counseling to a child? Is it? What are the problems that you have with it? On purpose. One of the problems that you have, though, is that you're going to have to enter into an agreement with every licensed provider. There's a program called Student Records and Confidentiality Rights. 
what ends up happening, and what me and Ms. Humbaugh talked about, talked about is you know, all the licensed providers want to come to do all their therapy at the school because the parents will take their kids to their office, which disrupts the school day, which takes them out of you know the classes that they're required to take, you know, or they graduate or the rest of the grade is great. So that I mean, there's it's yes, it would be nice to be able to have all these folks come and do that, and certainly that's what we want to do. We've had, we've had this problem and had this problem, you know, not argument, but, but issues with, 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 with private providers because they don't want to sign the contract or, you know, and, and what they really want to do is they want to run their practice in, in the school system. And, and that's the only thing, and I, and I, cause I'm, I see both sides of that, uh, and I know we've dealt with some of those issues, but then I also am struggling a little bit what Mr. Dodd's saying, not not against you, I'm saying agreeing with you, is how's that different from the centers? I mean, if, if we're going to have to provide the service, is the centers going to have that same scheduling issue um, that you know that a private would have, where they're they're wanting access to the student during the school day? I see exactly the the issues, but I'm not sure that we're not going to have that same issue with with either agencies. Um, I thought, and I, maybe I was wrong, that because they were more grant funded, that the cost of services in a community that had 70% of our kids economically disadvantaged, I thought there was maybe a, a benefit that they would provide services that, let's say, a third party wouldn't that was dependent on insurance billables um, that may or may not take Medicaid, for example. Um, I don't know if that was the issue because that, to me, would be a, a you know a big factor. If I'm referring a child, and the centers will take any child, and this particular agency will only take ones that take Blue Cross Blue Shield or something of that nature, that would concern me. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, but it, that and I can't I don't know say that I, for sure that they all do take Medicaid. I know at one time that some take Medicaid, some do not take Medicaid, and that is a concern because. Having been the counselor in the school system and knowing that a person coming in taking Medicaid will have access because the uh, payment's guaranteed, and the person needing a private service, no, because the payment's not guaranteed. So there's an inequity there. The Medicaid people usually can find someone because if that's paid by Medicaid, private, not so much. And also, there's a, there's a philosophical difference too in how a, a therapist approaches a student. Who, if you're looking at a group, say like the centers, you pretty well have a handle on the philosophical approach they have right. to work with the kids. If you're working with, and I used to be one of those, uh, a person who is in private practice, they might have 20 different approaches, 20 different philosophies, so it's, it's much more difficult to keep track of them and what they do, and you want to know what the philosophy of the group that you are bringing in is. And, and I and maybe I, I didn't explain that well before when I was saying people working under someone else's license. Um, and it's exactly like what Ms. Powers is saying. I mean, they have maybe 15 counselors working under their license, and I don't know how much it, it could be all these different approaches of you know what their philosophy is, where I, I know that that doesn't exist at the you know like the centers children's home society it's it's very consistent with with how they treat the, the uh, students mm -hmm. also the private person coming in uh, they've scheduled that hour or and I think they could go by 50 minutes but you know say the hour they've scheduled to come in and deal with that student now they walk in and, and a couple of years ago you had the FCAT do you think that child's going to be able to get on the FCAT to come do uh, a therapy session mm -hmm. will not be able to do it so they have to go by the school schedule but then that hurts them because they expect to go in quite honestly professionally go in and work with the child so there has to be some sort of compromise some sort of schedule uh, mm -hmm. meshed together to be able to do it and also the, there's the consideration of payment because if I if I'm there as a counselor and I say well I would like you to go to Dr. So-and-so I just committed the school system to pay that person going to the doctor so and so. So you have you have to be aware of that. You cannot just 
pick one person and say, go to them. Uh, you can provide a list. I know um, somebody has a list of people that are in the community. None are suggested over the other, but the list is given so people can, for themselves, root out what yes. they would like to do. It's just a mental health list of providers, and it has a disclaimer at the bottom um, that, you know, for a parent's convenience. But through mm -hmm. all of it, I can say, like, where we kept many years through all of it, as uh, difficult as it can be to, to select what you want to do, it's done and it works. And, and uh, Kit and, and the people in the school system, uh, Sarah, y'all do it well. You, you face all these difficulties mm -hmm. and still you do it well in the mm -hmm. child receive mm -hmm. services. But I wanted to ask this on Ms. Powers' comment though. Just because we contract with the centers and a child sees the centers, the school district's not obligated to pay the centers. No, I'm talking about uh, a private provider. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm, I, what I'm saying is with the reputation of the centers as not being that strong in my view, and with the only one other opportunity to lose home society, is I would like to see the school district have more providers contracted uh, so that students could have uh, the ability at, while at school to be involved with another provider. They obviously have to meet a contractual agreement, I agree. I mean, Mr. Bradshaw, obviously that's going to take place. It's going to have to meet our standards. But that's just my opinion, so I just, I just want to share I, and, I, and I don't know that I'm hearing that we're, I think we all would agree, more providers are a positive thing. What I think it is, is, and that's what I thought was going on in Citrus County, we have a limited number of providers that, that meet, let's say, the centers and the and Children's Home Society's criteria. Um, without having to go to Marion County or, or Hernando County, is that correct? Mm -hmm. is, is in Citrus County, other than centers and home, and children home society, is there anyone else that, that we are not provide, uh, that we are not um, contracting with that would meet that same level? Families first? Yeah. That's, but they're in, in I think they're based out of Marion, but again, I'm sure they're receiving funding. I, I think that these are, are agencies that we could get a contract with, like Families First. Um, I've been working on, and I know she's working on a grant, um, is um, Melissa Bowermaster from Jesse's Place. Mm -hmm. She and I have met several times, and that is about getting a counselor, mental health therapist, in each one of the high schools, mm -hmm. like on a regular basis. Um, to come in, you know, it would be a referral. She does the billing, she does, I mean, she would do all of that. Um, because a lot of the needs for there, students need to be seen there, but they don't get down to there. So she, we have felt like if they can come in and do some of that in the school, you know, like if you had one, one day a week at Citrus High School and one day a week at Chris River, maybe, you know, the middle schools as well but focusing on secondary. Um, it, I guess like with everybody, it's just kind of waiting on the funding and you know what's gonna be available. Um, but yes, there are other providers that we can certainly reach out to and have Mr. Bradshaw you know, look over an agreement with them that would fall under that, um, that more of a grant funded type group of people. Mm -hmm. good, good reputations, good referrals. And I think Mr. Dodd is correct. I think you're correct. You need more of them. Yes. Because if the county does um, replace or uh, have another agency that does some of the services that the centers does, that would potentially be another one. It may mean we lose the centers too. So right. we may just be trading one name for another name, which will necessarily add more, which which I think right. we want to do. Um, and, and, but I, I mean, I, I agree. I think we do need to add more. It's just a question of where are they? Okay. And I know Ms. Sundbach can look at the uh, education qualifications of those people who are added to be sure that they can provide the services we're looking for, the, uh, not just the counseling services, the like uh, level one, but they can provide therapeutic services. Right. That they're qualified and certified to provide therapeutic services. Right. 
The other question I had on your plan is with the training on the uh, mental health awareness training for all school district staff that's going to be offered. That's new uh, training for staff. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of expound on that a little bit for us on what the plan is there? Yes, you're way ahead of me, Mr. Dunn. Oh, I am. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. I'll do it now. <laughs> Continue on with it. Okay. Well, I'll wait till you get there. Okay, fine. I'll just go through these real quick and then because I'll have to keep okay. shifting back. Um, the data collection is part of the our plan. It's part of a requirement. We will have the, um, like when we do screenings, the students that we see, that information will all be kept internally in Skyward. And then school reporting, referrals for, um, like when teachers, you know, make a referral, like maybe a student needs to be seen, or when we make referrals for outside services, like external, we will have that within like a um, like an Excel database where just so that we're keeping track of all of these students that are receiving services. Collaboration is of course what we've been talking about. We are going to have to um, establish some more MOUs. Primary care providers are um, just again you know agencies that are are local. And then we do plan on having a agency committee meeting. It was the, it's the belief of, the, of our group that to get all of these mental health providers together, like everybody that has a say. I mean, it can be you know DJJ, just all of the agencies that we come into contact with regularly, just for us to to meet with them to go over what our plan is and what we need from them, the expectations, et cetera. So we plan on having that right about at the beginning of the school year. We have not set a date for that. Professional development, mental health awareness. Is this where your question yes. came in, Mr. Dodd? Yes. Last year, we developed, as most of you know, a, we did, several staff developments. We had positive school climate, we did mental health awareness where it was presented to staff on the varying degrees of mental illnesses from very minor to, you know, to others, like from anxiety on up. And this year, what has come down from the Department of Education is a couple of things. One is they are supposed to have a overview of the whole like why we have this mental health plan now things that have happened etc an overview that is supposed to be to us to the districts before the start of school which is like a 15 or 20 minute overview to go over it with staff then they are developing modules that will be online for teachers to complete like three 60-minute modules. I don't know, was it like two or three of them, Sarah, that they were talking about? Okay. And that's the Department of Education. However, those probably won't be here until like December or January. So what our plans are, and we're so something that we're working on, is for us to continue that mental health awareness piece with staff while we're waiting, we don't want to wait till halfway through the school year to address or readdress what we started with our initiative last year on mental health. Then crisis threat assessment, that is professional development that again they do the reviews but we've got new assistant principals, we have new counselors, etc. that we've got some professional development to do with those people as well as reviews. And then youth mental health first aid is, is what the, the uh, Department of Education is recommending slash requiring from districts. However, they don't have all of that in place yet. Mental Health First Aid is a all day training, eight hour training where staff is trained. And then you are, you've had Mental Health First Aid. First Aiders that you see up there those are, a, it's, a, it's like a cadre at your, your team, at your school, that will be trained in mental health first aid. 
to be like the overseer of, of mental health. I'm probably confusing you. I, I probably should back up. Let's say there's two people at each school that are first aiders. They go through that eight hour training and they are, they've had the training, they can, you know, share some of that information with the schools. As a district, we have to have or need to have probably 10, maybe a little bit more of youth mental health first aid people who can actually train people. And that training takes like three days for you to become a certified mental health first aid trainer to train these two people that the state is going to require at each one of our schools. So we're waiting on dates for that. It's not set up yet. Um, yes, Sarah, do you have anything to, else to say on that or? No, just that we don't have the dates yet and that we do have the youth mental health first aid training plan for all the school nurses. And I know some of the counselors and psychologists and social workers have jumped onto that training that was planned for the nurses. Right. So we will have some first aiders, but we need training. Right. And there are some slots available for that. But, and there are quite a few people in the district who have had this training. They've gotten the training through NAMI or just a variety, SEDNET of sources, but it's not something that everybody at a school has been trained on. It's, it's nearly impossible for a whole staff to go through an eight hour training. That's why they have opted for the first aiders, the two primary people at the school that have gone through the training to have the knowledge and, and share it with their staff. Not train their staff, just share the information with them. And when we went to Tampa, I went to one of the um, breakout sessions that was the Sandy Hook Promise. Yes. And um, I made contact with the father of the six mm -hmm. that was killed and mm -hmm. shook his hand. But that's a free. And so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave you with all of this. Oh, they'll, good. They'll come and they have programs for your middle elementary and high school and your teachers, six to seven hours for your teachers, and they cover exactly what we've been talking about the social isolation, the mm -hmm. threats, the mm -hmm. uh, uh, mental illness, behavior skills, and things like that. And it's free because of the foundation from Sandy Hook. So I'll leave that information. But oh, that will be that's good. Something else that we need to bring into the county. And that's one of the resources, the, the uh, website or something that was shared with us at our, um, the training that Sarah and I and uh, several others attended for two days on the coming up with this plan. That was one of the resources. It, it, it is all online. Mm -hmm. I, I brought your hard copy. Very good. Thank um, you. And then uh, Blair Friedman is, is in charge of the state of Florida, and we contact her for dates. But I'll tell you, it was a very successful breakout session, so very good. we need to call her and get online. There's, it's, a, it's a program that's worked in many other counties. OK. And the kid, after all this training is done, when someone's going to do that 10 hours or eight hours, or whatever, mm -hmm. they almost need de-escalation because it is almost overwhelming and you walk out out of your room into the hallway and suddenly everyone in the whole hallway has a problem you should yeah. refer everyone immediately yes. so it needs some de-escalation yes. afterwards yes <coughs> did you have another question about that mr dodd no I'm good. no that's good yes. okay oh how about those who uh work with us say say maybe uh, someone in the uh an SRO, let's say an SRO, are they going to receive some training to be able to uh, see what we see or know what we know or, or, or from our viewpoint be able to understand what we're dealing with? Will there be some training that, that is included for them to receive or no? Through, through. Okay. the statute, the SROs don't have to have additional training. Okay. Thank you. So they'll, they'll be learning some of the very same things we are, so we'll both be on the same page. And anyone who's going to be a state school officer or an SRO or a school safety officer for a large capacity of traditional I don't know that it says specifically, though, and I'm not sure that's what, if, you're, if that's what you're asking, who provides that training to them? Who does? Um, Mr. Bradshaw, say who provides it? Are they going to coordinate with the justice It just says undergo criminal background checks, drug testing, and psychological. I do think they have to have some more. Mm -hmm. Would you check on that? Because if we're coordinating, it would be great if we're both taking the same thing, you know the same stuff. It's true. Yes, Everything goes rapid if you do that. 
And then student education is um, mental health wellness, awareness and understanding. We're looking at some different um, pieces of curriculum for, as, as you know, we do have like Sanford Harmony that is uh, like K through six, but also some things we're looking at for, um, for older students. Just an awareness. Um, many things that, that I've read are that um, there are signs often, like the, the, there's a good example of the, the uh, situation in Texas that when they talked with students that knew that football player that they looked back and said, you know, I saw those things but didn't know that they were signs. So not like that we want kids to be out there looking for all these signs, but just an awareness um, that is one of the things that's not necessarily required by the department, but it's strongly recommended. And um, just, you know, just some little things. It could be things that are positively posted around the schools. It could be a comment that's made like in a homeroom, you know, a circle time where kids are just talking about some things. So that we are taking a look at, you know, before we roll that out to give it to the schools. But. That is definitely something that we want as part of the plan. And then I put a spire up there. They're doing a, um, a uh, group of students, working with a group of students at Lacanto High School this year for a youth, youth mental health first aid, where they're actually going to train some of these kids. I, I guess it's a new program, but as of right now, it's just that, it's like a pilot that they're doing with Lacanto High School. Well, we were down in town, we saw a, a girl and all of us saw it. Um, and it was called listen, but tr telling people um, to pay attention to other people, mm -hmm. to what they said to take right. in, and the value way that if something was wrong, act on it right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, th there were several children whose lives were followed, and you could see how their problems, their mental health problems, were progressing. Right. Uh, there, maybe it's something we want to look at, it's at least the teaching. It's a movie, right? Just well, now we're, yeah. we're showing that movie to our administrators. Oh, super. Back to the office. It's shown up to the super fans. Right. Classic. And then we'll see where we want to spend it. Because he's got different versions. He does need to know that. That's good, then, because the movie did give you a lot of information to say, hey, you want to referral right now, you know. So, that's good. And we'll tell you from the meetings, too, I started to think, because we were inundated with, with stuff. And um, I started to think, well, we require physical education. And maybe as we start to develop the curriculum, and especially with the Aspire groups, they, they help a lot with our health mm -hmm. classes. Um, but I started to think, why don't we require a curriculum and require the kids to take mental education just like we had them physical education. Physical education. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm thinking that we do need to beef up that curriculum and probably be very easy to do. And We'll have some flack from parents for interfering with them, but um, I think it's something that we need to consider. And, and you know, I know we we kind of talked about before, um, Mr. Sheffield used to bring it in, but maybe it's a good time to have a river project or somebody come back in, because I think some of that's incorporated into that, and it'd be, yeah, Spire that has that, mm -hmm. and it might be something just have them do on a workshop day or something, just review that. Um, maybe they can talk about what they're looking to add or you know, okay. how it's Sure, I'll make a note of that and, and speak with Carrie Pierce. Mm -hmm. I'm sure she would very much like to do that. All right, are there any questions? Thank you. And now we need to um, have a motion. I move to approve the mental health assistance allocation plan. Second. All right, motion by Ms. Bryant, second by Ms. Powers to approve the mental health assistance allocation plan. Is there any other discussion? Any questions? Okay, all those in favor of the motions, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion passes 5 0. Ms. Humbaugh, thank you for coming in and Great spending morning. this time with us. Thank you, Ms. Dickey, we wish you the best in your position. All right, item number four school support services. Good morning. Ask the board's approval of the instructional and support recommendations as listed on the goldenrod. Looks like we had some people that got their teaching certificate and are moving to the teaching field. That's a good right. thing to see. 
Move that we approve the personnel on the probation and support staff as recommended by the superintendent on the golden lot. Second. All right, motion by Ms. Count, second by Mr. Kennedy to approve the instructional support recommendations on the gold rod. Are there any questions? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 5 to you. We currently have 44 instructional positions posted, and some of those that are posted are in the, the administrators are in the middle of hiring for them, but they don't like to take the position down until the person has been cleared. And we have 19 support positions posted. Of the 44, of the ones that the teachers have, uh, will, uh, how many of that? If they're working on right now. I do not have that exact number. They come in throughout the day, so maybe I would say right now we have 10 or 15 that are in the process. Okay. All right. Well I not that quick when I say this. That actually seems pretty good for this time of the year. Yes. It's, Compared to the last few years, yes, yeah. I feel like that's a good place to be. And they're calling every day for hires, Excellent. which is a good thing. Okay, second item is to ask the board's approval of the 2018-2019 market adjustment for administrators. As the board is aware, the uh, market adjustment for teachers for the three years was approved last year. And so this year it is, compar it is based on the number of days for administrators. It comes out to $6.12 a day for teachers, so it would be the same for administrators based on the number of days. <coughs> Move approval of the 2018-2019 market adjustment for administrators. Second. All right, motion by Mr. Kennedy, second by Ms. Powers to approve the 2018-2019 market adjustment for administrators. Is there any questions? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion passes 5-0. Number three is to ask the board's approval of the 2018-2019 administrator placement schedules. We have one for both school administrators and one for district administrators. And the reason we need to increase the placement charts is because of the market adjustments. We want to keep that competitive. I move the approval of the 2018-2019 administrator placement schedules. Okay. All right, motion by Ms. Bryant, second by Ms. Kells to approve the 2018-2019 new administrator placement schedules. Is there any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, motion passes 5 0. Number four is to ask the board's approval of the updated job description for school social worker, and Kit is here as well if you have any questions. There was one change from the previous uh, copy of the job description which you have in front of you, and it is number 10, and it says to serve as active members of the school intervention teams and problem solving teams associated with crisis, threat assessments, mental health, and attendance. I'm assuming that's partly due to 7026? Yes, that is correct. Move approval of the updated job description for social workers. Second. All right, motion by uh, Mr. Kennedy, second by Ms. Kells to approve the updated job description for school social workers with that change that uh, Ms. Swain mentioned. Mm -hmm. Is there any other discussion? I'd just like to compliment you on the clarity of the new job description. Very nice. Thank you to Kit as well. <laughs> I think we're working on too the uh, the master's degree in social work. As the social workers come in, encouraging them to go on to the master's. Is that what we're doing? Yes, ma'am. That is correct. Thank you. Anyone else? All the, okay. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes five zero. Number six is to ask. I'm sorry, number five is to ask the board's approval on the new job description for food service maintenance foreman. And the board has a new copy. Um, we did change the area of supervises to bes besides the journeyman kitchen equipment mechanics, all other assigned personnel. So if Mr. Pistoni has other personnel that he feels needs to be assigned under that person, we will be able to do that. 
All right, can you tell me that one more time? That's different from what we have. Yes, sir. Together. In the previous one, it said supervises journeyman kitchen equipment mechanics, and we added and all assigned support personnel. So if there's anyone else that Mr. Pistoni feels needs to fall under our maintenance foreman, he can assign that person to them as well, or that mm -hmm. employee. The fact that they already had somebody they were supervising probably put them is that where the, the ineligibility for certain things regarding like uh, true time issues or um, um, evaluations? Like a head custodian, I'm thinking, does not, I think, super directly supervise anyone. Is that correct? So this person would, would already have not been eligible, let's say, to uh, be a teamster or something of that nature. Mr. Pistoni, they will. They, Mr. Pistoni will still do the evaluation, and and that person will still fall under them as far as, as far as, true time. They will, as with regards to supervision, I feel that it will still be, the work. They will supervise the work. Then, if there are any concerns, Mr. Pistoni will handle the concerns. Yes, regarding evaluations, they will add input to me when we do their evaluation. Okay. Okay, and that's similar, I think, then to like a head custodian then. Yes, sir. Where they're not directly doing the evaluation, then it's actually done. And that's and that's not changed in this, because you just are adding others. If you, instead of having two people, you might have three. That, they that is correct. Do that. Down the road, if we were to add somebody way down the road, we would not have to come back to the board and change the job description where it's just that specific journeyman. If we added a helper or something like that, the school district continues to grow. This person then will again assume that supervision of that individual as well. And and where on there is this again? I still don't see it this way on the change. What number? It is. It says supervisor. Okay. So, oh, so this isn't a performance responsibility. Okay. You are I correct. You. Yes. I, you. I was looking at performance responsibility. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very good. Thank you. What is the hundred pounds that could be required? If we have to lift any type of refrigerant, sometimes those canisters can be very heavy or anything. I mean, our guys lift a lot of different equipment. If we have to move a piece of equipment, they have to be able to somewhat lift that and move it. Usually they get help, that's why we have two guys. But uh, we definitely have to make sure we have some strong guys. That work for us. And they have to be extra. And they have to uh, work in wet, cold, hot, freezing conditions. That's not enticing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, is there a motion? I move to approve the new job description for food service man in school. Second. Motion by Mr. Bryant, second by Ms. Powers to approve the new job description for food service maintenance foreman. Is there any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 5 0. Thank you, Mr. Number six is to ask the board's approval to for Molly Chandler to be named assistant principal at Floral City Elementary effective July 16th, 2018. Move approval. Second. All right, motion by Mr. Kennedy, second by Ms. Bryant to approve Molly Chandler as assistant principal at Floral City Elementary School effective July 1, 2018. Any discussion or comments? Great choice. The contract services will be July 16th. <laughs> Miss, um, yes, Ms. Counts had a question there in July. Her contract date will begin July 16th. Okay. So effective July 16th? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Either one. Okay. Either one. Okay. <coughs> all right. Thank you, Ms. Counts. Okay. Any other questions? All right. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Motion passes 5-0. Ask the board's approval for Amanda Haynes to be named as assistant principal at Hernando Elementary School with an effective start date of July 16, 2018. I move to approve Amanda Haynes as principal at Hernando Elementary School effective July 1, 2018. Okay. All right, and now I think we're saying July 16, though. Is that, is that what you said, Ms. Yes, yes. July 16th. July 16th, okay. 
Is that who you reach out? Yes. Okay. Uh, Ms. Powers made a motion to approve Amanda Hayden's assistant principal at Orlando Elementary School effective July 16th, seconded by Ms. Counts. Is there any other questions or discussion? All right, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion passes 5 0. Retired Nancy Haynes just screamed somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Number eight is to ask the board's approval for Jamie Bays to be named assistant principal at Lacanto Primary School with an effective start date of July 16, 2018. Move approval of Jamie Bays as assistant principal at Lacanto Primary as of July 16. Second. All right, motion by Ms. Kelt, second by Ms. Bryant, to approve Jamie Bays as assistant principal of Kento Primary School, effective July 16, 2018. Any questions or comments? All right, seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion passes fine. Too. And they wanted me to let you know that they would have been here today, but they are at the strategic planning day. Uh, so that is where they are planning for next year. Okay. I love the form sheet. All right, Swain, thank you very much. All right, next item on the agenda is item number five, uh, our attorney, Mr. Bradshaw, and the Alice Service Agreement. Uh, Mr. Sergeant, do you want to talk about the Alice Service Agreement? Mm -hmm. I, I placed that on there for, for Ms. Sarge. Okay. We felt this was a um, very good program for us to be part of. We took it to our safety and security committee that Mr. Dodd's a part of. And then we had a shade session with you all and gave you more detail on what the Alice lockdown procedures would entail. So we are coming forward now asking that we move forward with the master service agreement to um, keep moving in the direction and to become an Alice certified district in August. Questions? Could you? Okay. Could you, okay. The Alice uh, Services Agreement. Second. All right. Motion by Ms. Powers, second by Ms. Bryant to approve the Alice Services Agreement. It was a three year. Three year option. Is it a one year or a three year? We don't Okay. That's what I thought. Okay. And the. Um, Sheriff's Office involvement um, as far as can you share with the board a little bit about what's going on? Yes, I had an opportunity to meet with folks from the Sheriff's Office to share with them how we felt about this. We had already initially mentioned it to them six weeks ago, but um, I met with them in the last couple of weeks and told them where we're at in the process, asked them their feelings on it, and they endorse it as well. They're, they're on board with this and they'll support it and assist us with this. And we do have Always one member of the sheriff's office at the uh, safety and security uh, meeting with the committee, which usually Sergeant Frank. But I think at the last meeting you had, you were sure that? It was Lieutenant Farmer at the last meeting. Um, Ron was not available to attend. But Ron has been involved in these discussions from the onset, which started two or three months ago. And of course, we know that they have to be an active part of the, uh, the drills that we do. Program. And this is an established program uh, that has a, a, a good track record. And um, I thank Mr. Bradshaw for what you've read over to and I think it's good with the contract. And um, this is the recommendation of this summer, right? Uh, and we all, the ones that I, I know we've all kind of looked at it, we've had the chance to talk to Shane about some of the issues, but we make sure, uh, you know, the public knows that when we are going to meet the requirements of the Senate bill and exceed those requirements in providing drills and protection for our students on campus. And, and I'm supportive of this very much. Um, but Mr. Dodd and I, and maybe some of the other board members, went to a training in Florida School Board Association that had, and I don't know whether these are competing products, whether they're complementary ones, but um, you saw that. I was glad you saw Yeah, and yeah. I just, Six plans, know. and I know uh, Ms. Search is aware of that, and uh, Ms. Simmons too. And we may, I think, 
think there's been some discussion on some of the things that they offer, uh, safe plans as far as school planning, but as far as the active shooter training and what's going to be in place, it is a little bit of a different, I mean, they That's use different was accurate. Yeah. yeah. So we will we'll be going with the ALICE. They use that alert um, acronym. Uh, I think you've probably seen it, but it is real. And real similar. Similar. Yeah, it it seemed very similar, yeah. and it just, um, but they did have some things that were interesting. So again, I'm, I'm supportive of that. This is research-based, and there are steps we can take to become an actual ALICE certified district, and we're going to take those steps. Okay. We have a motion on the floor. Is there any other comments? Okay. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion passes 5 zero. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Bradshaw, do you have any other items? I do. I want to give you an update on the SRO contract and other issues that are, that are going. I sent a draft SRO uh, agreement over to uh, the county and to the sheriff's office. The county was fine. There were some issues in regards to the SRO contract. I had a conversation with their, their attorney. I think we worked through most of them. One of, the, one of the bigger issues is the providing of coverage during summer school. Um, the sheriff was under the impression that we had never mentioned summer school. We didn't know that they would have to provide coverage during summer school. And I think y'all can go back through and look. I mean, we had talked about a 10-month contract versus a 12-month contract. Uh, one of the biggest issues that came out of that was in March when the law took effect March 9th, I think it was the 14th or somewhere right around there, we had our board meeting. And the board voted to fund half of the SR, I think five additional SROs to the end of June. Um, I think that number kind of rounded out to roughly $96,400. Uh, in the month of June, the Sheriff's Office did not provide a full-time deputy on campus um, during the summer school. And so I know a letter was sent by finance and I followed up with a letter that I had sent to the Sheriff's Office saying that you know, we were reducing the amount uh, of the uh, $96,000. Dollars, excuse me, by $27,531.31. Um, my letter said we'd be happy to pay for the, the time that was spent there, but because it wasn't a full, you know, they weren't there the entire time. I'll pass out an email that I got from their attorney on Friday, um, which basically says that the sheriff was, and you, and you can read it, but the, the base basically says that we don't pay the $27,500. Can you repeat that again? Yeah, well, it says the outstanding $27,531 must be paid before this agreement will be signed. It says, again, we demand payment for the outstanding. Yeah, and, and I had a conversation with their attorney yesterday, and we went through this, and I think there's a fundamental misunderstanding in that the when the, this board voted in March to provide, to fund half of the five SROs in June, the sheriff has interpreted that to mean that that was for salaries, training, capital expenditures, and you can see that in paragraph two of, of, of the email, um, to... I'm just, by the way, reading in the minutes of that meeting where the motion was made by Virginia Bryant made a motion to fund 50% for five new SROs beginning March 14th, 2018 until June 30th, 2018. It was seconded by myself and it was approved unanimously. That was the motion, that was the second, and that was the vote. Correct. So I... So there is somewhere, there's confusion Apparently, that that meant that we were going to fund five new SROs completely, half of five new SROs completely, which kind of doesn't make sense when we talked about having to have 22 come July 1, where we provided funding for 22 starting July 1. So, anyhow, I'm kind of at a stalemate because if they're not going to sign the uh, school resource officer agreement based upon the $27,400. Any 
basically this is asking for us to pay them for services never rendered. There is the Auditor General opinion which talks about you having to you know, provide some detail in, in showing what, what you're actually paying for. And that was in regard to an SRO contract, I think it was in 2004 or 5, somewhere back in there. It was not against us, but they, 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 uh, the auditor, uh, auditors uh, you know, got onto the district because they weren't keeping track of the SRO. Not necessarily you need to do it minute by minute, hour by hour, but they didn't have anything in writing showing exactly what the SROs were going to do. Um, and so they said, you know, they, they flagged them for it and said they need to have something more specific. Um, which to me means that you should get paid for services that were rendered. Um, that is the problem, is that uh, I don't know if there is a number that, of how long that the, the deputies were going by the summer school locations and providing services, but I do know that they weren't there from the beginning of the day to the end of the day. So it, it's interesting, in our motion following that, in our minutes, it says Chairman Dodd felt all campuses need to be covered, including AES and Crest. Following the discussion, the vote was taken and carried unanimous. And then also, one of the other issues I'm having is the, is the, is, is the issue of summer school. Um, there is a, um, I don't want to say a position, but the sheriff has, seen, has, has indicated that he knew nothing about us having summer school programs and that those need to be covered. But the motion was to provide those additional five well, deputies I'm, through the end of June. I'm talking about for next year also. Next year, yeah. Because we talked about providing coverage in July and having issues with that. My conversation with the sheriff also, when Mr. Mullen was the bishop, Ms. Harnage and Ms. Wilson met when he was team, we talked about a 10 month contract and brought that up for the UK deputies their hourly rate or time and a half for the summer. And he um, told me that they need to go from a contract because they do work for us through the summer. So that was where we left that meeting, knowing that you all had approved that money that they would be covering uh, our schools in the summer. One million motion. Correct. That was July 1 through June 30th. When the, when the legislators passed, or when the, the governor made his recommendation of having one SRO on every school, before that was signed, I was grateful that our sheriff put uh, deputies in our schools because of the importance of making sure there was a deputy on every school campus. I'm not sure what's changed. Well, if you remember at the Board of County Commission meeting, uh, I think it was uh, Mr. Coleman asked me what does the sign mean? Does that mean you have to have someone on campus, you know, you know basically bell to bell for lack of a better term? And I don't believe that's what the law says. I think that that's what the intent was, although it's not what it says. I know there are, are multiple districts that cannot comply with that. You, know, you have bigger districts where um, it will it ends up being a situation where they're still at primary and elementary school is going to have you know one SRO per so many schools because you just the numbers aren't there where you can have that many new SROs. You know, if you have to have 85 or 100 new SROs, you know, there's no way to, to, to have you know, to have that many people you know, starting August 10th. But isn't that what we paid for was to say that we were going to ensure that we had deputies right. and replacement deputies right. to ensure that high level of service? Correct. Right. Right. Well, how many schools, I mean, it's a small number of schools that actually have some school, correct? I mean, if we're going to have 25 full-time school resource officers in a contract, how many schools are we talking about? Ms. Cernic has a list, and there's some days that we need nine, some days we need three, four, and there's two days we only need one. Uh, nine That's, SROs. And if you want to talk three. about what we had last year, last year what we had 15 SROs? 16? We had uh, 16. 16. We, we basically run three elementary schools. We run our three high schools uh, for credit recovery, and then we have Crest as a 
some school. They have it every year. I, I know that the. It's not I've heard day. a comment that, well, we didn't know that there was that we'd have to do summer school. We didn't know that we'd have to do any of this. This is, I mean, that, that's a change in the law completely as to, because prior to that, we've, we've been exceeding any of the mandates prior to 7026 going in. So none of us knew what we would be needing to do until 7026. Correct. I mean, that's why I didn't indicate that. I thought we complied with the law the day that it was passed because we have been a very diligent in school safety and had, had already provided an SRO for every high school, middle school, and then uh, for most elementary schools and primary schools, I think it's about one for three. Um, and so I thought, uh, my, my opinion was we, we complied on the day that it was passed. Uh, summer school, I'm not quite sure you know, we had an SRO or one that was assigned there during the summer school, but I, I also explained even if we didn't have the SROs at summer school last year, you know, everybody's working under a new set of rules now. Mm -hmm. Right now with, with 726, which has implemented that you know you at least have to have somebody assigned there and you know take that for what it means is that you change or something there from the double bill, which I think is which all of us I know agree that's the best option. You know, but I don't think that, that legally I think you can have like we can't have, talking about two different things. Like the month of June, there really isn't a contract in place. So what we're doing, um, there's an interpretation. One is theirs and one is ours. For July, Mr. Bradshaw is working diligently to try to get a contract in place for July. So we treat this as two different discussions to get a direction from you or... Although I am having a kickback on the summer. But, you, but that's why I say in June, I mean, before we even voted on this in June, the sheriff, and I and I respect the sheriff for doing this, the sheriff put deputies in the schools immediately. We didn't wait for a contract. We didn't wait for there to be. So, I mean, we've still been working through the end of the school year, though. We were still, we still didn't have a contract that changed from that. But not during summer. But I'm saying it didn't, but we still didn't have a contract for what was what we were doing in March, April, and June, you know May and June. So I'm saying so through. So at this point, there's nothing that's been different from the regular school year to now, whether we had summer school or whether we had regular school. We still didn't have a contract. Well, we had the 1718 contract, which provided for 16 SROs. Which, which again, the sheriff had already exceeded on that. Which ran, which runs through June 30th. And that's why we added the five. And when the bill passed. We needed five additional SROs for, I guess, no. correct. Now, so that would contract, so that would be a total then of 21 SROs. So correct. where are the 21 SROs from June? From when was school out? May 25th. May 25th through June 30th. Well, I don't think he had five additional SROs. I think that, to, to, but in, in the spirit of safety, I think. I think I remember him saying he pulled them off the road. Pulled them off the road, which yeah. was fine. I mean, that, that's. But there was 21 we were paying then at that point in the. I mean, 16 in the contract. And, or, and, half, and five additional paying half. I think the problem is the interpretation that that was kind of like the start of us going to find those five SROs. But from the end of the school year, we wouldn't if we would have at that time said that. I think we would have made the motion then to end it at the last day of school. Instead, we did it to the end of June, which was the contract because the contract goes until the end of that period of time. And I want to remember discussing when we were at the with the um, EOCC um, the concept of the 180 day teacher contract, school contract, and. I believe he was insisting on a 12-month contract. He didn't want to work on a 10-month contract. I remember that. That's correct. And I defended that point of view because of the issue with, you know, having a, an officer full-time is a 12-month person. 
so that right. we weren't going to have 10 month contracts. So I'm a little bit surprised that he was the one that brought up that he wanted to provide them. I think they, they tried to provide coverage, Ms. Sarnage, if you'll correct me, six, about 65% of the uh, a lot, amount of time that we needed full time coverage was actually covered. So that we are responsible for the month of June for in our schools. Okay. We because that's what I was just going to say. Because Mr. We Martin, calculated the schedule about when they were able to provide coverage and when it was uncovered, and we calculated that about 65% of the time it, it's been covered. Because Major Learn, uh, Learnhart says, Learn, Learnhart, Linhart, Linhart, I'm sorry, said we definitely, it was in the paper today, quote, we definitely are giving the schools coverage for summer. We feel it's the right thing to do. I, I thought I was comfortable with hoping. I consider interjecting the conversation. Uh, Ms. Cernich has been working with uh, Major Lynn Hart uh, with the Sheriff's Department to come up with a schedule of coverage they could provide uh, for the month of June and throughout the uh, remainder uh, of summer school, the summer school services that we provide. As Mr. Mullen indicated, that the schedule that uh, we were provided does provide coverage for upwards of about 65% of the time there. Ms. Cernich is working with our school sites now to confirm what times the SRO or deputies have been on, on campus providing that service because we thought that would be beneficial to the board in your conversations um, as you're having about the $27,000 to say, well, certainly I think the uh, Auditor General's opinion would uh, have heartburn with us paying for services not rendered. However, they have rendered services, but we're trying right now to go through and come up with a very concise number as to what percentage of services have been covered so we can provide that to the board so you guys can have some informed conversation uh, in regards to that $27,000 that seems to be in the way of the uh, agreement that Mr. Bradshaw spoke to you about this morning. Well, well it yes. It's only the right thing to do. That's right. I, I, I would agree with that. It's a situation of not providing full payment for partial coverage. I guess there's one sentence in here that kind of bothers me, and that's a sentence that says, this is a mischaracterization of the purposes of funding and a petty argument in light of the larger concern of student safety. I think they're missing larger concern. Larger concern is student safety, and that's what we want. And that's what we are funding, is student safety at all of our schools. So how are we mischaracterizing that? Are they wanting full-time SROs and then wanting us to pay additional for summer school? Is that what they're saying? It, it may turn into that because the, we are still discussing, you know, I had placed in the original agreement that it was for the regular session and summer school and they are taking out regular set, uh, taking out summer school. So with, with the argument that that two month period is when <coughs> SROs make a comp time for working more hours during the school year for when they get their training for uh, you know vacations you know the other things that they typically don't do during the school year because they're at a school five days a week but the flip side of that is in years past we've had 16 SROs and I think that included um, a sergeant and a lieutenant as supervisors, but now we're going to have 22, with, with still with three additional people as super, with three, with three supervisors. And, uh, I don't understand why some of those folks can't, you know, cover some of these schools during summer school with other SROs while other ones do. Our staff has to do that all the time. Right. We we're always having to take our our uh, 12 month staff using it to cover and do coverage for our 10 and 11 month. But Mr. Dodd, agreeing with what you just, your concerns that you said, again in the paper today, um, the major was quoted as saying, the, the Florida Sheriff's Association's attorney has said that he doesn't interpret the bill and the law to be for summer schools um, and just for normal school sessions. Well, that concerns me to say that we're having a different standard we're going to apply for summer school kids than we are for our traditional school year kids. That, that, that's, a very, that's a very concerning quote. What, what article are you with? Um, it was by reporter Zervis. Um, <laughs> the, the uh, <laughs> and it's, uh, I'll send you the link. Well, I'm on the phone. 
but my problem still goes back to the BBLC meeting um, where he was talking about vacations and things like that. But on the 10 month contract, we're still working only 180 days. They have vacations at uh, Thanksgiving, vacations at Christmas, they have spring break, they have three day weekends, they have, um, uh, we have professional development days every day for our, every month for our teachers um, when we train our teachers. So I still have a problem with, you know, he wants to pay for 12 months, even a 10 month is still only 180 days that the kids are there. And we offered him 1.1 million and it's not enough. I'm just hoping that I think that there's just some misunderstandings because I really believe when the sheriff came here, his concern is to have a system that is representative of the model for the state. And I just am hoping that we're just got some misunderstandings. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think this kind of catches me, uh, I would say off guard, but I'm yeah. a little surprised because I thought we were all on the same page with the social safety and the requirement to have, you know, protection for our students on our campus. So, um, you know, I can understand though in some ways as far as this year with the schedules and with plans that the SROs have already had, uh, but it's still a management issue. But you, did you say, Mr. Bradshaw, that going forward, even into next school summer uh, or next summer, that it would impact next summer as well? I'm still having that conversation. With I'm, 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 I'm unsure as to where we are on coverage next year. See, I, I took the focus totally different as the BOCC meeting. I thought the focus was on the money because the commissioners were saying they're not funding anything. He was asking for more money than we really had and we're going to get. And I saw the focus not on protection of children, but I saw the focus on how much money are we going to have to pay. And that's why to my position has been to not tell the sheriff where he needs to spend the money. But for him to say, is right. And, and I thought that 25. We agreed to 1.1 million, which was a significant amount over what our state funding is, in order to say this is the model that he believes is necessary to keep our students safe, and we have exceeded that. And it's not enough. March agreement though at our March board meeting when we funded the uh, the ninety six thousand three hundred and forty seven dollars and fifty nine cents and in the motion as it stated that it was for five additional SROs through June 30th that would add to the contract and I actually for some reason want to say the contract says 15 SROs so this would add then a total of 20 SROs that we contracted through the end of June. Superintendent, you're saying that it ranges anywhere from one student to as much as, I mean one school as to as much as nine schools and probably averages closer to seven. And we're only covering with the 20 that is funded, we're only covering 65% is what I believe we're being told of coverage. That's what they've scheduled to cover? That's what's scheduled. We've got to confirm if they're actually coming on those and, days. And my feeling would be is I am happy to pay. I am happy as a board member for us to pay the $27,531.31 that our schools are covered. But, but we can't pay for something that's not being done, especially if there's, in theory, 20 on the payroll. and. You know, granted, we understand what it's like. We've got summers 
people taking vacations, people having to do, but we still have to cover those schools every day. You still have somebody in our schools every day in leadership, even though we have people taking vacations, because we can't keep those campuses unexposed. We have the same management issue. What is the schedule for summer after July 1? Because the contract, the new contract begins July 1st. Uh, what is our, it what's the schedule? Probably going to be approved until July 10th. Right, right. But what is the summer schedule uh, after July 1? Sure. We need even less in July than we did in June. Could you come on up to the podium, please? Sure. Okay. Kind of off the top of my head, but in July we need a little less than we did in June. I believe the first week of July we needed still seven schools to be covered. The second week I believe we needed three or four schools to be covered. And then the third and fourth week we've only got one school that's got something going on. That's off the top of my head. Okay, so the expectation we all have is the schools are going to be covered um, when students are at school. And I think to give Mr. Brad, what I'm thinking to give Mr. Bradshaw direction is we make sure that as of the new contract, that that is expected starting July 1 of 2018. That that is why we have SROs on 12 month contracts. And it's a simple management solution that I think can be worked through with the numbers that they have. Now, as far as paying the money, honestly, I know there's an argument that they didn't really good service, so let's not pay them the money. But I would just as much rather pay them the money that we said and make sure that takes place. Make sure, though, that they know that that is what we require and, and that they're, it's totally clarified as of July 1, 2018, in the next contract, that there's no communication problems. That's what's expected. Now, that's just my idea. So, board, obviously, you guys can bring up some other thoughts on this. I'd like, I'd like to say that in the, in the interest of caring for our children, We'd like to have protection whenever there's a child on campus. That's, just, that's not, crazy people come out in the summertime. You better be protected from them. Just my, you can put that in there if you'd like to. Yeah, we also talked about that. You know, the, but we, we're talking about summer school specifically because the kids are in the classroom. But, um, we talked about this earlier because we have kids on our campus. I know at the high school level they're there every day. There are band camps, there's, there's RO, there's, there's so I, I don't think we can say when they're there, kids on campus. Start, start school. Kids start school. Kids start school. But I still have a problem with, with him asking for more than the 1.1 1 .1, um, and the $92,506.67 per month. And then we look at what how many they're working in the June and July, um, and paying 92506 for seven schools for one week, four schools for another week, and maybe one school for two weeks. It's, huh? it's two separate, right. it's two separate agreements. Yeah. There's the, you know, the numbers fall too close together, which all is cost me something. But you have from the March 14th, I believe it was the board meeting, through June 30th, and that was really, you know, the law got passed, the sheriff wanted to put five additional SR you know, deputies in the schools. This board voted to pay half the cost of doing it. It's roughly what happened. Then we came into negotiating what we're going to do starting starting July 1 for, for all of next year. And that's, you know, we came to a number, it's a little more than 1.1 million. You, you divide it by 12, and you're going to pay that, you're going to pay that amount out every single month, which is fine. I think the expectation is that, that there will be some coverage for that for that amount of money. And it, you know, it, it's even though there will have to be less SROs working during June, July, 
there's the money's going to be the same, but we agree that that's the that's the coverage that we agree to. That's the same way we do our teachers. Well, well, we pay them for 100. So the first six days and we spread it over 12. First thing we need is direction for the month of June. When you pay, like Mr. Brock said, it's worth 27,000. We're paying for when they were there. That's what we need direction first before we get to the July 1 contract. I think they have to tell them a certain time how much how many uh, hours they provided service and then we'll pay for those hours but we're not going to return the 27 but i still want that money back you're going to say the percentage though uh, yeah if they work we'll pay them for what they work but if they didn't work then we're going to wind up with an audit problem later we've already gone into our reserves which is going to reduce our our school um, effective and so then if, if we come up with a bomb audit because we pay for services not rendered um, our job is to be good stewards of our tax dollars' money. Is it possible for us to pay them the twenty seven five for simple users? And if we find out that it is less than a hundred percent coverage, that in July's payment it can be reduced. Uh, at that time, I, I think. Wes, you may disagree with me. I think you're you're covered under even with the 27. If you did the 27, as Mr. Dodd suggested, I think you're covered right now because there's not a contract that says anything other than that, and there is a degree of service that's provided. The argument is whether it's 100 percent of what we thought we were getting and what they thought they were providing. So. I mean, what, I think what Mr. Dodd's saying is, okay, there's a misunderstanding this month, then let's get it worked out. But for July, make sure there's no misunderstanding. This is what the expectation is. And, and, I, and I tend to go along I think, with that. I think the audit part, we could probably write that up. I still have to believe that this is a misunderstanding because I thought the sheriff was very clear that he wants his deputies on the campuses when there are students in school. And there are students in school in the month of June and July. And so with that, I I can be agreeable to us um, releasing the 27-5 and saying that that I, I have to believe there's a misunderstanding, but you will, but because you are going to have people <coughs> on there every day that there is kids in school. And, and that's the issue. The, the issue for July is the, uh, is the dates that Ms. Summers has been provided. They're offering less services in July than what we're provided with in June. So that's, that's to be worked out yet. Hopefully we can get that worked out. Because so far he, they have said, we cannot cover everything you're asking for in July unless unless they change their stance. That's what they've said. So I, mean, I guess the conundrum is that if you pay the 27 today, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get full coverage in July. We're still arguing over the July coverage. Which well, is different. It would be a different contract. <coughs> well, it would be a different contract. We're still working on that. But I have, I mean, it's been, the issue of summer school is probably one of the major issues that. It, it doesn't make sense. And again, I, I, I can be agreeable to the 27.5, but it doesn't make any sense going forward if we have a 12 month contract with the sheriff's office. And this would now be for 20, how many is with next year's? No, next year's. 25. We'd have 25, which would be 22, 22 schools covered plus three. So, so on January and July 1, 2018, we'll, we will have contracted for 25 law enforcement officers. And you're saying this, this, the, what the sheriff's office is saying is they cannot provide for a 12 month period, they can't provide anybody in July in the current funding schedule. They can provide some in July, but just not full coverage. But they're not, but, but the entire reason we did this was for full coverage. That was the entire purpose of this. I think our interest has been to protect children the whole time. And it still is. And also, you mentioned about from bell to bell. Actually, teachers arrive half an hour early, uh, the half an hour later. Yes, but the, the contract that I had sent was that uh, their, their, their hours, or, uh, they have to be there with instructional personnel 
arrived or dismissed. So that would be half an hour prior to Whatever instructional personnel so the, 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 the make your mm -hmm. I prefer to be on the I'm I'm willing to do this and to, to get through the first part of this and that is to uh, make a motion that we um, release the $27,531.31 to the Sheriff's Office uh, for coverage of our schools in June um, as was uh, originally voted on uh, on uh, March 13th, 2018. Just for that purpose, I mean, for this, for that part of the conversation. I, um, so that would be my motion. My comment only would be, uh, before somebody seconds it, is that it would be my intention that what we voted on at $1.1 million for 12 months will include coverage for all the schools um, while students are in session for, uh, from July 1st all the way through, from July 1st, 2018 through all the way through June 30th, 2019. Yeah, but I would make a suggestion. If you're going to do that, you're basically saying that we're going to, whatever the coverage was in June, we're going to pay for it. For it. And we'll just go ahead and we'll do that. I would make that contention upon the assurance that Contractual assurance that summer school is going to be covered in July. Then, then that's how I would make a motion. Um, that we pay, that the motion is 27500 uh, yeah, That's correct. Okay. Uh, $27,531.31 released to the Sheriff's Office for payment in June with the assurance that coverage for summer school contingent. continues and, con and that, that a payment is upon, contingent. contingent upon it. 18-19 in the 1.1 in the 1.1 and that's and the money would not be released until that agreement is in place all right is that yeah. separate yeah. 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 Right. yeah i wanted to make sure yeah. 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 i thought we're on the same thing all right motion by <laughs> mr kitty second by Ms. bryant to <laughs> Pay the $27,531.31 to the Sheriff's Office for the month of June, contingent upon a clear direction in the next contract, the 1819 contract that specifies SRO coverage, full coverage while school is in session at any time. Yeah, any time schools in session are running, including some school clubs. Is that right, Mr. Yeah, uh, that Mr. Bradshaw? I, I, I believe that would be covered. I've got another question, though. Of course, there's other issues in the contract. I would just no, I understand that. that. I have, I'm, I'm just talking about this part. I have problems with other issues in the contract to, that I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm... Okay, so you, you want to bring up another issue in the contract, right? right so I okay. I'm, I'm not sure I approve of this contingency going to the 27th. Okay, so Mr. Bradshaw, when you have a motion to second on the floor, I know there's more to discuss about the contract. So should we go ahead and approve this vote or vote on this motion and then come back to the I, other issues? I, or? I think that, I think what it is is that there's some other issues that I'm discussing um, with, with the Sheriff's Office. I mean, I think it needs to be contingent upon the summer school definitely being covered starting July 1 and the execution of the SRO because I don't, I don't think you want to give the money unless we have an executed SRO agreement mm -hmm. with, with the sheriff. <coughs> and then, and, and not for not, I think you need to be very clear on what you say and how it's worded so that there's no misunderstanding. And the motion, you're saying? You I think, you know, I think that the motion, if, if, if what Mr. Kennedy said was that willing to pay the 27, whatever it was, right? And have it contingent upon full time full coverage starting July one for summer school and all other schools regular school sessions through June thirtieth of two thousand eight of nineteen mm -hmm. and the execution of the SRO agreement mm -hmm. by all parts. That's the county's going to sign it because the money's going through them. They don't care, but we need to make sure that you know we're not piecemealing that together. And that and that is what I'm saying is my motion. And I still have other issues. 
Could and I, and I have that or not. I think the other issues. I just didn't know that they were germane to the, the this particular part of it. But I definitely thought we needed to have a conversation about that. Correct. But I just thought, as far as what I'm willing to say that we should, you know, pay on, is I didn't think that they were germane to that part. Well, Mr. Green, last time we all sat here and, and all and of did these, this. five of us heard what was being said. We thought the sheriff and, and the board agreed everything was fine. Never expected anything that's happening right now. So, so I think that's one of our concerns to make sure we get it totally clear, as clear as clear can be. I don't, I don't, I, I still am stuck on the fact that it doesn't come down to making sure our children are safe and there's protection in schools. It always comes down when there's a misunderstanding with the money. And so, you know, I just, I took the $96,359 and I just took the days from March until the end of June, came out to $178.44 a day. And if we didn't get that service in June, I have a problem with this man just saying, we're mandated, we've got to do something. He knows we've had to do something. He's backed us up on every negotiation where we're running out of time to come up with any other alternative. And now he's demanding full payment of the $27,000 back. I'd rather see a billable hours for June and pay that bill. Well, the thing of it is, Sandy, you I know. You are prepared to cut on our bills. Well, but I said it's a bill for June. Obviously, there was some confusion here. I think they thought we were trying to do his job. I don't see a confusion. He said this. We asked for the service. He said this is what we would pay for. He did not give us the service. That's true. So if he wants to bill us for whatever he provided for us in June, we'll pay the bill. But it's certainly not going to be $27,000. All right. Well, we do have the motion and the second. So, Ms. Counts, I appreciate your discussion. I would like to just ask for other discussion from other board members as far as this motion. You know, one of the things that I would like to ask the superintendent is we still have this week. And if we're saying that we're going to give you the money and then in July 1, we're starting something different. I mean, in my view, we're really not starting anything different because it was what I agreed on from the very start. Right. I think Mr. Kennedy, that's what we all kind of agreed to, that we're still going to pay him the $27,000 to get us through June. He still has to cover this week. I mean, that's my view. It's his responsibility right now as the sheriff. And after seeing the work that we've done and the attention, I don't want him to miss the larger concerns to the safety. You know, that's what we want. And so I think that this week in June, Ms. Surich, are we covered this week? Not fully. I would be a little hesitant to talk about that in a public meeting because I could jeopardize safety in our schools. So I would certainly defer to Mr. Bradshaw on that. But if we say where coverage is or isn't or if there is a place where we don't have coverage, and I'm not saying there is, I think that we would jeopardize the safety in our schools. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. But yet, Major Linhart has mentioned that they are covering the safety of the schools for some school. Isn't that correct, Blue Team, as far as assigned? The answer is not fully. The other answer is fully. Well, the quote that was is we definitely, we are definitely giving the schools coverage for the summer. We feel it's the right thing to do. That was what was said. It did not specify the amount of coverage. It just said coverage. And earlier, though, I believe in the article, it said that they would not require, that they, that he would not discuss what, where coverage was for security reasons. All right, we have a motion to second. And, yes, ma'am. 
And just so you all know, we're just talking, she's getting the numbers on. They sent us, she sent them a schedule of school, summer school out. They sent us a schedule on when they would put people That's how she's asking on it. And like that separate, that it weren't done in cooperation with each other? No, right. But we have the expectation that the schools are, are being covered. I mean, that's... I, I, I always thought that was the expectation. I didn't think that was, had changed in many times. Yeah, we didn't have any concerns with it. I think that we were totally covered when all these things come up. So, yeah, we're in those people. And the allergen in the room is that the, these SROs that were working in our schools have been reassigned to, to different duties. They're not available to us. That's the end of it. Was the sheriff's office invited today? They knew, they knew about the meeting that was for the attorney and uh, he's saying that. So they, they did know. They, knew, they, they knew, knew the meeting that they we'd be to. They knew the I, I think there's still, and, and I don't and disagree with Ms. Counts on this, there are still some issues within the contract for the 2018-2019 school year yes. that we have to, to address. I just don't know, Mr. Chairman, whether you want that to be part of that, the, vote, the conversation before the vote on this. Well, that's why I said it needs to be intentional. And that's what I thought, but I just wanted to know. The, the other issues that uh, have without getting in, you know, into, into all of that, I think that um, the summer school issue is probably the major one. I think the other issue is a little give and take when we work out. Do you feel the big give and take? Well, there's a yes, break according, this, I just, that some of the other issues are, you know, we want to call the school resource deputy and explain the long history that we have of the SRO program that we have with that. Um, you know, some of the, the reporting requirements are, are, are time. Um, and I also understand trying to work with that and trying not to manage his people because that's not what we want to do. But we also need to protect ourselves from the auditor general in regards to making sure that we have the services. Um, you know, there's a couple, couple other little things that uh, I, I think that I can work those out. And if not, I'll be right back sitting here for you. So, uh, but the, that, this was the ultimatum I had. I, I knew that would come from that discussion. And then the, uh, the summer, making sure that we were clear on the summer school, which I've been very clear with them, that was our expectation. So, we may not have much to talk about after this afternoon when we get a phone call. I just need a direction of what I think. Um, 70, but I'm kind of perplexed by that. 7026 refers to school resource officers Correct. in statute. So that's I would think that's what we have to, that's what we were referring to in our contract. That's the way we refer to it. The other thing that I think was lost in the discussion their rationale on that was that um, I think we started in 1985, 84, with an SRO program, probably one of the first in the nation. We had, were nationally recognized, you know, and we had for 30, four or five years, four or three years. And so we have always had a school resource officer, in addition to the statute indicating it's a school resource officer. Um, I think that there is a tradition in the history of this county that goes back you know, for a long time. But there's why there's still a school. Honestly, he can call his deputies whatever he wants to. He can call him a school resource deputy if he wants to call him a school resource deputy. But the statute is not his for a school resource officer in our history. It actually says requiring a school resource officer. Right. Yeah, I think that uh, I think. That's not the big issue. Yeah, that's not, you know, it's a school resource officer program. You know, that's what we always talk about. That's what we all agree to. I mean, I mean, you know, that's in every discussion we've had in a public meeting, it's the SRO program, right? Mm -hmm. So if he wants to call him something else, a uh, school resource detective, or school resource <laughs> officer deputy, or whatever, then that's up to the sheriff. I don't have a problem with that. call whatever he yeah. wants. It's a school resource officer program. Yeah. Okay. 
So there is a motion and a second. Is there any other discussion on the motion? Um, are we clear on, on what Mr. Kennedy's motion is that we approve the spending of the full $27,531.31 um, to pay for uh, this month of June um, contingent upon the understanding, the full understanding, that starting July 1, 18 through the June 30, 19, uh, contract year that the contract will specify full time coverage um, whenever school is in session with an SRO there. Yes. Um, and that the other, and contingent upon the, the other parts of the contract being approved. Is that your Contingent word? upon everything executed. Executed contract. And, and that's the second that I believe. Ms. Who is the second? Ms. Brian? Yes. Ms. Brian, is that your understanding too? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So we're clear on the motion. All right, so last time. Uh, satisfy the, the words that are in the motion. Can't be, uh, again, explained in three or four different interpretations. Yeah, I think it's very clear. We're, we're only paying the money if we have full coverage, we have full coverage for a lot of money, And I think the other part about executing the contract also means that you know, we're not paying this the other small issue. Which I, 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 I feel pretty good about it. Yeah, I really yeah. do. And you feel the definition of full coverage would be clear, is clear. My understanding is what yes, I think that y'all made it very clear that when school is in session, whether it's regular session or summer school, it will be on the school. That's clear on that, in my mind. We're not going to pay that from $7,000 until we have everything else in place. Correct. So that's the motion. Okay, are there any other um, questions or comments about the motion? All right, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Yes. Okay, we have one nay. Uh, motion passes uh, four to one. Okay, uh, Mr. Bradshaw, is there anything else you need to talk about on that? Okay, all right. All right. Um, <coughs> I will ask for Simpson comment again. I know it's not on the schedule, but I do try to take that at the end of the regular business of the meeting. So is there any Simpson comment? Anyone want to approach the podium for comment? Okay. Seeing none, uh, any other business that needs to come for the board? Board members? Uh, my, just to let you know, after we do this section, we're going to take a break, and, um, and then we'll come back for the workshop topics. But, um, Don, I just wanted to let you know. Yes, just informed today that micro school will close this year. Uh, oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. Board voted to disband it last week, and so they're going to be working through that process. Wow. wow. That's a shame. And the teachers that are there, will they come back into our system or no? They, they were not our teachers. Students will come back to us. Well, Your most of those. Will, some of those teachers may have gone. So, uh, Ms. Rowan, so as of this coming school year, there will not be, a, I mean, micro school, are there still programs going on there now? No. Okay. We will, wow. we will work with them, Mr. Rowan, we'll work with them, just humbug to uh, when students that are eligible to come back to our school system will come, get that opportunity to come back. Did they say why they were doing that? <coughs> Funding and enrollment. They had a conversation this morning earlier with the governor's point to go to next year, so I think the governor's will close by the end of the fall. Okay. Thank yeah. you. All right. Ms. Wright? Ms. Powers? Uh, just briefed that at Fernando Elementary School yesterday was a strategic planning, and it was so good. <laughs> I'm telling you, everyone engaged, uh, went over a lot of people to stuff, discuss mental health. But I mean, they were on target so, so the others that John might go to, I expect you going to the same thing. Had a good time in Tampa. I'm glad to bring the, the San Diego promise to the board. And um, I went to the um, Board of County Commissioners yesterday, saw the Lucanto kids um, get their certifications for their campaign on keep uh, our litter off our streets. They were a good group of kids, um, well represented the kids of our, our school. So that was 
the only thing I did want to say is I don't want to lose sight of the fact that we did have the county commission support us in the school resource option yeah. program and support the community, right? Because it really is a community effort and the county commission did come yeah. step up to the plate and we're very appreciative of them for uh, what they've done to the school resource officer program. Okay. okay. All right, with that, um, I am going to I'm going to adjourn the special meeting and we'll have a 10 minute recess or break.